Hey everybody, I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can set up the amount that you want to give, and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center, or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. If you've never watched that, now you turn these back on. Thank you for showing that, Chris and Gene. Uh, how many of you have seen Superman movies? How about Superman TV shows? Oh, wow, okay. Comic books? Two high school buddies, uh, Jerry uh, Siegel and Joe Schuster, just high school boys, were the ones that wrote the first comic book in June of 1938. They wanted a man that possessed supernatural powers. Reason, a lot of things happen we don't know the reason, is because in 1938, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were beginning to move forward in Europe and it wouldn't be long that they'd be taking country after country and their war machine was beginning to squish everything under it and we needed somebody that would fight against evil and win every time. How do you like that? Well, we know that it started as a comic book and then it went to a radio series and then it went to a TV series. I watched the black and white back when I was a boy. And then it went to blockbuster movies that we saw just as like this one and some beyond that. I want you to realize something. There is something about what we just saw that changed from the original script. Schuster and Siegel never wrote into the script kryptonite. But the familiarity of somebody that never loses gets old. So you add a new thing, a radioactive component from his home country that weakens him just like any other man. And they introduce that. And you know what I found so interesting about this Superman is there are startling contrasts between Superman and us. How many of you would say that you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ? Everybody here, are we are all apart? I'm looking for sinners right now. Well, not, I think we all got hands up. I, I, I'm telling you, we're the church of Jesus Christ. And in the Bible where you find the church general spoken about, five times more you have about the local assembly where people gather together like we're doing right now. This is the local expression on Highway 27 here of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's like Superman. Superman, first of all, was not of this world. And John 17 says, Jesus said, you are not of this world. Paul said that you have a citizenship in another country. Amen. I'll, I'll accept that. Superman possessed supernatural powers that the average human being didn't possess. I'm not sure you're aware, but the church of Jesus Christ has supernatural powers that an earthling that doesn't know Jesus doesn't have. Superman fought evil. The church fights evil. Superman would rescue the weak and try to help the helpless. Did you know that if it were not for the church, there would not be one hospital? There would not be one orphanage? There would not be one food bank? I could go on and on. Every one of them started by the Church of Jesus Christ. That's why they've got Baptist on the hospital name or St. Dominic's is because of the fact that we help the weak. Do you agree? Superman delivered people that were victims of villains. 
And I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ still has got the power to deliver people that are bound by a villain called the devil who have been victimized all their lives. We still got the power to do it. Do I have anybody in the house witnessing with me? Superman received his strength from the sun. S U N. But we receive our strength from the sun. S O N. Hallelujah. Superman was born of a supernatural father. And you and I are born of a supernatural father. In fact, the Bible says these words, so powerful. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. It did not say, as he is, so shall we be in the next life. It says, so are we right now in this world. Yeah. Paul said, or Peter said, that God has given you, us the church, His divine nature. The nature of a thing is what is the essence of it, what it, what it does, who it is. It says, and Peter says, He's given that and deposited in His children that belong to His church. Yeah. Which simply tells me something. These preachers that stand up and say there's no difference between the world and us. And the bumper sticker says it. I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven, is heresy. There's a world of difference between a child of God and the people of this world. Have you ever seen a lion give birth to a squirrel? Have you ever seen a thoroughbred racing horse give birth to a dog? Nobody looks at a butterfly and says, wow, there goes a caterpillar with wings. <laughs> because we know that, yes, it was a caterpillar, but there's been a transformation happen on the inside of a cocoon, and it's no longer crawling the earth, eating leaves. It's flying because it's not a caterpillar. It's a butterfly. There's a world of difference between the two. We're not of this world. We don't belong to this world. We are of a higher origin as superpowers that we ought to be. So therefore, if our daddy is not Zeus or Hercules, fake Greek mythology gods, but our God's the real God. Real. All-powerful. All-knowing. Omnipresent. If that's our Father, and He's all-loving, unstoppable love, wisdom beyond the ages, peace that passes all understanding, joy unspeakable and full of glory, all-knowing power, don't you think his kids ought to demonstrate some of that? Amen. Yes. Don't you think that Einstein's son ought to know how to do two plus two? <laughs> you that are watching this, don't you think that Bill Gates' son should be able to pay his light bill? Right. Huh? I mean, and don't you think the kids of Almighty God ought to have and possess certain things? Yes. From our daddy? Yes. And yet, when I look at the church of Jesus Christ, so locally so and around the world, I see so Superman with kryptonite around his neck. Yes. Mm -hmm. Weak. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Yeah, a lot of them didn't make it to church today. Yeah, so. The temperature's not 70. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a snow. Oh, I, you know, it's such a hard thing to get to church when it's like that. Oh, you pitiful thing. Yeah, well, I, I see the church is in kind of a pitiful shape. Mm. Now, remember, kryptonite was the only thing that could weaken <coughs> Superman. He gets around it, it weakens him. Uh, did you know there's a spiritual kryptonite that is weakening us? As the church. And I want to tell you, you're as smart as you look. Oh, man. Yeah, you're as smart as you look. I'm telling you right now, I can just simply say this, and everybody here get it. I say, what's the church's kryptonite? And everybody's hand raised up and say, oh, we know that, preacher. Sin. And you know what? You're right. You win the prize. <laughs> Only except you didn't get it all the way correct. It's not just sin, because sin comes in different portions, different consequences, different levels. 
This is the biggest sin the church can commit. The biggest. Now, it's not going to look like the biggest. It's not going to sound like the biggest, but it's the biggest. And I'll prove it. Look at this scripture right here, because Paul gives us the kryptonite in these scriptures. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, what not discerning the Lord's body. Say those last few words, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, go to the next one. For this reason, many are what? Weak. Weak. Sick and what sleep? The word sleep there, if you do the other translation says, dies prematurely or an early death. This is not in nine years old and you're dying at 90. This is a premature death. So because of this, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or die prematurely. For we, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. The world. Now, there are three things that he says is the consequence of this sin. Three things. Weakness, kryptonite, sickness, and premature death. Everybody say it with me. Weakness, Weakness. sickness, Weakness. premature death. Say it again. Weakness. Sickness, premature death. Do you know that we had someone left our church a few years ago, and here was his reason. He was a minister. He said, I cannot continue to attend your church because there is a spirit of sickness on your church. And so many people get sick there, and I cannot continue to abide in an environment where sickness flourishes. My words on the end, but basically that was the essence. I can't continue. Hey, hey, can I, can I just be, can I be transparent with you? Is it okay? Are we, are, are we all going to be transparent? Sure. Did you know that nearly everybody that has ever been my associate pastor has either got a divorce or their wife has died of cancer? We do know that Annette, Travis has been my longest term associate pastor. The first one with Glenn, her brother, she lost her mind. And she became a bag lady. And they divorced and he's been remarried for several years. But I'm just saying that was what happened to my first associate pastor. The second associate pastor died last year from cancer. Travis McManus was my next one and his wife is dying of cancer over in Quitman, Mississippi. Uh, Gary was my uh, worship leader. Uh, Gary died from AIDS just a few years ago. Um, who else we got beside that? Charles, his wife. Died. Uh, I know that she was a little bit older, but uh, nearly everybody in a group, we went in a group setting, nearly everybody in that van, Charles, our mates died. My wife died of cancer. Karen's scared to death that something's going to happen to her. Hey, I'm just going to tell you something. After a while, I could go on, there's more than that. I could tell you that the MO is that there's something at work hidden behind the scenes. A kryptonite that has hurt us. I'm as dead serious as I can be. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to the root of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, it says three, three things why at this particular point. Everybody say them with me again. I want you to say it again. Weakness, Weakness sickness, sickness, and premature death. Okay. Say it one more time. Weakness. I want you to get this. Why? For what purpose? What did they do to get those three things? Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning. You say, that's the big sin? That's absolutely it. Now, not discerning the Lord's body can mean two things. I think it has at least two applications to it. Okay, is everybody ready for that? Not discerning the Lord's body. The context of this, and I'm going to do a little teaching, so just wait, wait, bear with me. The context of this, this, this thing is in the taking of the communion. 1 Corinthians 11 is the word size so quote when we take communion. So he says, because you eat and drink unworthily, you're eating, drinking damnation to your soul, to yourself. And so it's in the context of the communion. So when we take the, the, blood, the cup and we drink it down, it represents what? The blood. 
the blood which cleanses your sin. But when we eat the wafer, we know what that represents. That's what? The body, the body of Jesus Christ. We know what his body did. By his stripes were what? Yeah. And Jesus made a statement to the woman who was the Canaanite, and she said, I, I need a healing for my daughter. And he said, you don't give the children's bread to the dogs. He called healing children's bread. So the bread of Jesus Christ, his body, represents healing. And when people do not rightly discern the healing part of Jesus, they don't get healed. Yeah. There are churches that don't ever mention the stripes of Jesus. You can go to churches where the pastor will never preach on divine healing. They don't pray for the sick. They do not exercise that particular part of the scripture. And so therefore, that, that particular scripture and others are basically void and kneel to them and has no effect on them whatsoever. They go to the doctor. They do their own thing with medicine. They never really consult the Lord because that's not part of their life. I believe that part of the, this, this text is saying, because you do not take advantage of what I did in my body to heal you and deliver you, not just healing of your body, the healing represents the healing of your mind, your emotions, the healing of your, your psychic man, the healing of, of the other parts of your being. So therefore, you're, you're weak and you're sick and you're having a premature death. That's number one. Does everyone kind of agree with me there? Yeah. Not taking discernment about the cup and the, the, really the bread. The second thing I believe, and some texts have double meanings or double applications. This one has it. When he says the reason you're weak and you're sick and you're dying a premature death is because you're not discerning the Lord's body sitting right here among you. Yep. You do not have any discernment of this man right here, this young man right here, this man, this woman. You do not really discern. Now, discern means understand. You don't have an understanding of how they fit with you in the body. And therefore, it's not working for you. I'll explain that in just a minute. But let me, let me read a scripture to you. Uh, can you put that next scripture up? Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's what they were supposed to be coming together regularly to do. For in eating, each one, everyone say each one, each one. takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Now that's interesting to me. That's interesting because of the fact that some were feeding themselves on this supper they were having and, and just gorging themselves with what they brought and someone over here doesn't have anything to eat and they just made them watch while they ate and drank. It reminded me of the uh, young man who was driving his uh, wagon to the market with wheat in the back. It was a wagon and the, it turned overturns. And when it overturns, the farmer that lived in the house beside it came out and knew who he was. His name was Willis. And he said to him, he said, Willis, said, uh, uh, I tell you what, we're getting ready to have supper. Why don't you come in and eat with us? And then I'll come out here and help you overturn your wagon. Turn it back over. And Willis said, uh, no, I, I, I better not because I don't think my daddy would like it. And he, he said, Come on, son, we got the meal ready, and you need the strength, and I'll come help you in a little bit. Yeah, uh, come on and eat with us. He said, well, okay, I appreciate your offering, but I don't think Daddy will like it. So he went in and ate the meal, got, got up and started to go out, and, and he said, thank you, I feel stronger now, but I still don't think Daddy, Daddy's going to like it. He said, oh, don't worry about your Daddy. By the way, where is your Daddy? He said, under the wagon. That'll make daddy not like it. <laughs> that he got stuck under the wagon when that boy was in, eat, in eating a meal. And he got stuck there. That's what happened in that scripture. They got stuck starving. One gets drunk. One doesn't even have any food to eat. And God says, you're not discerning how the body works together. My question is this. I don't know if you noticed that. If the NIV it says some, that says one. Can one person in this building or in this body, affect you? Yes. yes absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, really? Yes. Yeah. Where that one day you wake up and you have all these feelings and you wonder what the world's going on with me and where in the world is this coming from and it has nothing to do with you. Is there a possibility that somebody in this body can be doing something and it actually affects you? Yeah. I'm going to give you some examples. It's called the principle of community. 
Everybody understand? The principle. Everybody say this with me. This is a teaching. The principle of community. What does that mean? Genesis chapter 7. The flood comes. When the flood comes upon this earth, it destroys every living thing. Mm -hmm. That breathe there. It, it destroyed it. Which means that generation suffered from a disaster that made Katrina look like a spring shower. Because in verse 22 of chapter 7, it says, Everything that had the breath of life in its nostril died. Now, I understand that there were wicked and perverse people on the earth. But how much sin can a three-year-old do? I believe it would have been the best thing for God to march up that ramp into the ark, toddlers, right. two by two. Because they were just as innocent as those animals that God carried into right. that ark. So I've got a question. Why did God kill babies and three-year-olds and four-year-olds? Why did God allow them to drown? Only one answer to that. And that is simply, God did not deal with those children as an individual. God dealt with the culture and the people. And those children's connection to their parents who were connected to their culture got the judgment. And they got judged along with it. If you go over to... Just any particular, Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't the per perverts that got burned to death. It was the little kids that got burned to death. Do you understand that? And when Pharaoh is rebelling against God with his stubborn heart, it's the three-year-olds that can't drink anything but blood for days. It's the four-year-olds that have gnats swarm on their bodies and eat on them. It's the six-year-olds that it says when boils came on the Egyptians, it said, and came on every one of them. Six-year-olds got the boils from the head to the foot. Mm -hmm. And when the firstborn died, it didn't matter if you were 55 or you were five. The firstborn of all the Egyptians died, whether you were the Pharaoh down to the sweet street cleaner. I'm telling you what, you, these folks all died. When Rahab hid her family behind the scarlet thread. The Bible says that everybody there was killed. And one man messes up. Achan disobeys God. Listen to this. Takes that wedge of gold and that Babylonian garment and hides it in his tent. And when he does, did you know that God had Joshua send 600,000 warriors against Jericho's wall and we do not have not one report of a death or a wound but 3,000 not 600,000 3,000 are sent against Ahi Ai a city a little bigger than Terry, Mississippi and they run out of the city and do a whipping on them and kill 36 of Israel's men did you know that 36 moms and dads didn't have a son by the end of that day 36 wives didn't have a husband come home hundreds of kids didn't have a daddy not because of what daddy did but because of what one man did that nobody knew about mm -hmm. and the Israelites come and to Joshua and they say did you bring us out here to get us killed by the Amorites and Joshua falls on his face before God and God said get up off your face Israel has sinned. Oh, wow. He didn't mention Achan. He didn't mention one man. He mentioned the whole lot. Israel has sinned. God judged them corporately for what one person did. Have you ever been in school when you didn't do anything but that little smart aleck blankenship that's in your class? <laughs> Threw the chalk, drew on the board, spit watch somebody and the teacher comes in and says hey there's not a one of you going to go to recess today because one of you messed up and I'm going to hold all of you here anybody ever had something like that because it's a corporate punishment did you know that God does not look on us as just individuals do you understand that God does he sees you as an individual but he sees you more. He sees us as a unit. Everybody, please. Amen. 
when God looks at us, Jeff, he, doesn't, he sees you, but he doesn't see you. He sees you as an individual. He'll deal with us as in individuals, but there's a corporate dealing that God will deal with a group because God sees us as one. In a little bit, I'm going to get out here and I'm going to get in a Chrysler 300. I've got a steering wheel. I've got wheels on the side. I've got a battery. I've got a gas tank. If I was to bring all of that up here and set it out in front of you and say, would you drive me home with that steering wheel, that gas tank, that battery, that wheel sitting here, you'd have a hard time getting me there. Now, if you put gas, if you got a gas tank hooked, to, hooked up to everything else with gas in it, you got a steering wheel on the column, and you got a battery that's charged and everything needs to be charged, and you got all four wheels on that thing, in just a little bit, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get out of my car, and I'm not going to sit there with my hand in my, in my key and say, I wonder if the lug nuts are on this thing. I wonder, I wonder if the carburetor's going to work. I wonder if that fuel and whatever it's called now. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. No, you know what? I don't expect any of that. I expect it all to work as one. I start it up. I go. I think of it as one unit. Yes. When God looks at us, listen, he, he sees not slices of bread. Right. The Bible calls his church one loaf. Yes, one is. loaf. Yes. Yes. When God looks at us, it's not a, a, a 50 or 60 or 70 brides. There's one bride. Right. One body. Am I, am I right? Yes. He sees it as one. We, we as individual, a uh, man came in the 1700s or 1800s, I forgot, I was reading it, but he said, he came and said, I compliment your country. You have individualism that is just unique. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and take care of your family and be a pioneer. Yeah, that's good. But he said in the end, yeah. it'll become your weakness mm -hmm. because you don't know how to do anything together. That's right. Oh, Lord. Is there a possibility that when God looks at us and there's a sin that goes on? Look at this scripture right here. I want you to, to see. The, give me that other scripture up, here, up there. Do you see it? Read it out loud for me, everybody. Now, you collectively are what? No, you correct collectively are Christ what? Hey, I got news for you. Listen to me. Me and mine and I and I'm going to take care of me and all that stuff. You're not the body of Christ. You're an individual member of it, but you're not the body. You're not the bride by yourself. You're not the loaf by yourself. You understand? He called us a building. Well, one building. How many parts are in this building? Does somebody say, I'm going to go, I'm going to go visit the carpet on... Highway 27 today. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to go up there and see the, the, the flags. I, I'd like to see uh, the panels in the ceiling. Why, you came up to a building that's one building. It's many parts, but it's one building. And you came to this one unit to be a part of what we're doing right now. I'm telling you, the mind problem of the American people is you and I, you and I, is we think so much individually of our families and our few that we don't think that <coughs> what's going on in the corporate setting is really yeah. doing anything to us. That's right. And we've missed out on something bad happening because somebody else is living in sin and we condone it among us. A little leaven. Re quote that for me. A little leaven what? Unleavens the whole thing. A little leaven leaveneth or makes the whole thing leaven. Look at this scripture right here. Put that up there for me, Chris. I want you to see this. From whom the whole body, everybody say whole body. Whole body. Joined, everybody say joined. joined. And knit together, that means compacted together, by what every, by what every joint, what, wait, that the whole body joined together by what every joint supplies. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Keep that up there, Chris, please. I want you to see this. The word joint is not something you smoke. Joint is a, the word connector. Doesn't that verse right there tell you that this whole body is knit together and grows, you know what it says, by what each individual joint supplies? Which simply means 
My heart was put in my body to function. But it doesn't function for itself. It sends it out to all the rest of the body to help the body go. My liver functions. Hallelujah. Amen. My kidneys function. Can't wait to close this out and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm an old man. The parts of my body were made to function. This made to function. What if my hand says, hey, I'm mad at the whole kit and caboodle, and I'm not going to wash anything. I'm not cleaning up nothing. How long would it take for this thing to be stinking in disease? <laughs> what if the eye says, I'm tired of being, you know, get stuff in it and everybody mistreating me. I'm going to quit looking. Or the ear says, I'm going to quit listening. I'm telling you, the only reason I can walk up in front of you right now is because my mind is working throughout the parts of my body saying, hold this microphone, speak these words. I can only do this and operate what I'm doing because my body's working together. I tell you what, all you got to do is talk to Bo and say, what happens, Bo, when a part of your leg, the blood flow stops? Well, one thing is they said, we're taking your leg off. Thank God they operated and they got 50%. But if you watch Bo walk, you'll find out that Bo is still having problems with that leg and he limps because why? 50% of it's not working. And I'm telling you, the body of Jesus Christ needs to realize the reason we limp and we don't have the healing or the power or the ability to do what we need to do is the same reason a baby can't do it. A baby, when it's born, its head is one-fourth of a portion of its body, which means its body is so much smaller than its head. Its head is much smaller. That's why it takes 15 years. By the time it's just a few five years old, that baby's head will be almost the same size it will be when it's 15 years old. So the body has to catch up to the head because the body is emaciated and weak until it gets strengthened by various things that feed every part of that body. And G Paul says, according to how your body grows, that's the way the church ought to grow. Right. And realize that I may be shriveled up because this person over here is my connector. And there's the blow, blood flow stopped. And I feel weak, sick, and I die prematurely. I'm going to use you, Crystal. I'm sorry. Simply because Crystal did not know her place in the body, did not operate in it. Therefore, the supply stopped with her. I don't get it. The reason why there's so much weakness and sickness and death in this church is because a lot of you have not found your place. and don't realize that we're not going to accomplish anything unless people begin to connect. Yes. This is not a Sunday morning good feel good sermon. I'm telling you, if we think we're going anywhere as a church and you're not connecting with us and you're coming and sitting once in a while and don't even know people's names and not, you're not even a part of what's going on here, you're, you're not a part of this body. You're a visitor. But the real parts of this body have got to step up to the plate to be who they are. Listen to this. I'm almost closed. My brother-in-law was named after John Glenn, Glenn Lafferty. John Glenn in 1962 set atop of a 90-foot missile. All of a sudden, countdown, and he took off 17,000 miles an hour. And John Glenn circled this earth four times, splashed down out by Bermuda, and was the first man to orbit the earth as an American. Did you know that, listen to this, John Glenn would not have got on board. He did not mash the buttons but until Katherine Johnson. Wouldn't you know it'd be a Johnson? <laughs> Catherine Johnson told him it's okay. He did not trust the computers. This is 1962. He trusted the woman who they made a movie out called Hidden Figures. Why? Because she was an African-American woman in a white world. She couldn't even eat in the restaurant. She couldn't drink in the same water fountain because she was a black lady. She could not operate under certain guidelines as a woman in NASA, because it was a man's world. They ran everything. Women were a subservient female servant. That's all they were. And so therefore, and yet John Glenn says, I'm not going to orbit the earth and be the man that my this boy is going to be named after unless Catherine Johnson tells me, green light, sir, go. And he did it. Seven years later, 
we're going to be on the moon. But you know how many people it took to shoot the moon? 400,000 people. From the people that made the spacesuit to all that worked the computers to everybody that knew what had to be done. 400,000 people. Listen, I, I'm telling you something. Nobody shoots the moon by themselves. Yeah. Nobody orbits the earth by themselves. Right. Yes. If you don't have the teamwork, you'll never have the dream work. Yes. It'll never happen. You've got to have a team. That's, right. That's why your brother, when they took him in a while back, in the military. The first thing you got to do when you get in the military is you got to take out of their mind certain suppositions and thoughts. One thing is you think you, me, what I want to do. No, sir. You're going to wear your hair like we want you to wear it. You're going to eat when we say eat. You're going to get up when we say get up. What is all that boot camp and hard nose in your face attitude about? Tell you why. It's to do what we need to do in this church. And that is get people out of an individualistic my mindset to where I'm a team. I'm a part of a unit. I'm going to cover your back. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to know how to fight for you. I'm going to be able to stand with you. I'm going to be able to conquer with you. I'm going to be a part of you. And I'm telling you, those men come back from those battlefields and say, we're bonded under a bond that cannot be broken because we did it together. 2002, nine miners in western Pennsylvania bore into an adjacent mine that was full of water. They could not get out. We got them out 77 hours later. That's over three days. And the water rising, and they had to tread water. Now, I've been a swimmer. I've been at Boy Scouts. How long can you tread water? i tell you what the men did. The men tied a rope around their waist and tied it to the next man. And they said, they made this statement to me that would, it just phew, does something to me. They said, if one of us lives, we're all going to live. If one of us dies, we're all going to die. All for one and one for all. We're going to make it out of here together. What if the church of Jesus Christ says we're going to fight for each other? We're not going to let them just slip through the cracks. We're not going to let people go hungry and us get full at the dinner table. We're going to see how everybody's taken care of. Don't you know that's why the early church was so blessed? It's because they sold properties and took care of the widows and everybody. The Bible says they all shared together like and like. And God blessed that. He says, I will come command a blessing where Jesus I want that blessing yeah where oh. brethren dwell together in unity there there I command a blessing where you dwell together unified the biggest problem springs of praise will ever have is for people sitting on seats paying a little tithe going home and never finding out what they're about I was in Pink, Oklahoma, a little nothing. But it had a retreat center outside of town in 1970. When I went to college, I played my little guitar and sang. I'd go with preacher boys out to preach. I wasn't called to be a preacher. So I did what I could. I put my hand to whatever I had. I told someone the other day, I said, when they asked me as a teenage boy to be an usher, they said, we've watched your life, Daryl. You, you're living the life. Would you be one of our ushers? You think that's not a big compliment? It was to me as a 16, 17 year old boy. I had 70 and 80 year old men taking up offering with me and they invited me along. And I counted as, an, and every time the doors opened, I was there. And I took up offering just like it all depended on me. And I tell you what, when you begin to, I'm not bragging on me, but I'm telling you, when you put your hand to what you know to do, you may not have the full picture yet, but you do it with all your might, God begins to promote you. Oh, hallelujah. And I, I, I'm feeling something in my bones. In Acts chapter 13, it says five men, and it calls them prophets and teachers, were gathered together in the church at Antioch and said they prayed and fasted together. And then the Holy Spirit, while they're praying and fasting together, says separated to me Saul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I have called them. By the end of the chapter, he's no longer Saul, he's Paul. He's no longer a prophet and a teacher that identifies him. In the beginning of the chapter, he's an apostle of God. God has promoted him where in prayer and fasting with some other brothers that said we want to get a hold of God and God said I'm going to promote that 
Come on, let's stand. If we show up here on Tuesday night and pray, and it's, it's 10 of us, it's 12 this past week. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just telling you, we'll, we'll all be fine. Will we all go to heaven if we just meet like this, a small little group like this? Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll keep spitting on you and everything. <laughs> preaching the best way I can. I'm not preaching to you like you're a big, like you're a little crowd. I'm preaching. I preached this way to my son's church a couple, of, three weeks ago, and uh, get a lot bigger congregation. I'm just telling you, if I'm going to give you something, I'm going to give it everything I've got to give it to you. Yeah. I'll put everything I can into it if it's just a handful of you. Amen. And I'll do it on Sunday nights and everything. But I'm just saying, is there ever going to come a point where that you figure out something? What are you? In Pink, Oklahoma, I went before God in that retreat and cried out. I said, God, I go help play the guitar and I sing. And I'm in choir school, and, but I don't know what, I, what, what am I about. A blind man preaches that we, that retreat. He became our bishop, Leon Stewart. I didn't even know he was blind because he could walk down there and feel trees and he walked like he was, I could see. I, didn't, I watched him. I, didn't, I couldn't tell he was blind. Didn't know it until after it was over. <coughs> he preaches on a Saturday night about do you know where you belong? You, do you know your calling? I slept on him the entire time because of the fact that I'd been in a retreat with boys staying up all night. And we'd play football and everything else, and so I slept. And I got toward the back. I don't know why I did it, because I didn't, I didn't think he's blind, so I didn't know I got toward the back so I could hunker my head down and sleep without even knowing about it. Yeah, I see some of you. And I'm telling you, I woke up. I tried, Believe me, I slept through his message. I woke up to hear him say, do you really know where you belong, what your calling is? And I felt the compulsion of the Spirit say, get up. I thought, this is crazy. I don't even know what he's really saying. He said, come up here if you feel a call. I felt a compulsion to come to the front and kneel. And he says, I'm going to lay hands on you. God's called you to preach. And my, my mentor, Dr. Frank Tunstall, has the gall, this is Saturday night, to have me preach to all the faculty and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pupils at the chapel on Tuesday. Yes, I threw up going into the place all over their flowers. I didn't know what preaching was, but I'm telling you, mm -hmm. I would have never discovered my, my part in the body if I hadn't begged God, please show me. Can I ask you to do something? During this three days of fasting and prayer, can I ask you to do this? Lord, would you show me where I fit in the connection? What is my connection? I'm going to tell you what God will do. God not, may not get you the whole picture, but he'll give you the next step. Do this. Do that. Simple. Uh, the Bible says the mile of a good man is ordered to the Lord, right? No, just steps. What does steps. it say? Steps. 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 Just steps. It is a way out, John. Look at me. If you do not know your niche, your calling, your place, can I, can I tell you something? In all likelihood, your supply to the rest of us. He is not there. And we become a shriveled up. Let's do something for Jesus. Uh, uh, who is that? That springs of praise walking around town. Uh, you can laugh all you want, but if you're not supplying, so I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. Stand. 